When you're considering a peak in an infrared spectrum, there are three things to pay attention to. The frequency, position along the x-axis, the intensity, and the shape. We've talked at length about the frequency at this point, and now we're going to turn our attention to the signal intensity and to the shape of the signal. Now, signal intensity is most directly related to the magnitude of the change in dipole moment during a vibration. So during the vibration of a bond, which involves shared electrons, there will be a change in dipole moment as the electron dis di distribution of the bond is stretched right, or compressed during the vibration. The magnitude of that change in dipole moment depends on how polar the bond is to begin with, is one way you can think about it. More polar bonds will experience a greater change in dipole moment as they stretch or compress. And so the larger the dipole moment, the greater the change in dipole moment, and the more intense the absorption. And the extreme of this is no dipole moment at all for nonpolar bonds or stretches that do not change the dipole moment of the molecule at all. For example, perfectly symmetric stretches that take a nonpolar molecule to a nonpolar stretch structure, there's no uh, uh, infrared signal at all. A good contrast between polar and nonpolar bonds is shown over here on the right of the slide, where we have a CC double bond and a CO double bond plotted on the same scale. The CO double bond is very clearly polar, one of the most important polar bonds in organic chemistry. And because it is very polar, C and O differ in electronegativity quite a bit, stretching the bond causes a huge change in dipole moment and the signal is very intense. A CC double bond is much more weakly polarized and as such, Although the bond itself is nonpolar, when it stretches, there is a small change in the dipole moment of the molecule overall, assuming the stretch is not perfectly symmetric. And so we do see a weaker signal. I'd put this in kind of the, the medium intensity realm right here. Now, if that alkene is positioned in the middle of a molecule like this, which is perfectly symmetric, when the alkene stretches, no signal will be observed at all. So for this molecule, tetramethyl ethene, tetramethylethylene, there is no CC double bond stretching signal because there's no change in dipole moment as that double bond stretches and compresses. And more generally, vibrations that cause no change in dipole moment like this, because they're symmetrically disposed or they're perfectly nonpolar bonds, do not display signals in infrared spectra. When it comes to the shape of an infrared signal, the broadness of the signal depends more or less on the diversity of electronic environments that that stretching bond can find itself in. And hydrogen bonding is an extremely common source of broadening, particularly in alcohols and related structures containing a hydroxyl group. Hydrogen bonding causes a distribution of OH bond strengths as a stronger hydrogen bond may actually weaken the OH bond, but this occurs to different degrees because there are different distances between those hydrogen bonding atoms throughout this, you know, moles worth, Avogadro's number worth of molecules in the sample or, or something like that. On the other hand, an OH group that is not hydrogen bonding will display a typical sharp looking signal. So for example, in a, in a uh, two butanol, in a sample of two butanol diluted in a solvent, there's some free OH that's not hydrogen bonding due to the relatively low concentration. And that shows up as a very sharp peak here that's around 3,600 wave numbers or so it looks like. But most of the compound is bound up in hydrogen bonds. And those hydrogen bonds manifest themselves as a very broad peak between about 3,600 and 3,200 wave numbers here. The broadness of that peak is very characteristic of the hydroxyl group due to its hydrogen bonding. Carboxylic acids display the same thing. They have a hydroxyl group similar to alcohols. And the unique thing here about carboxylic acids is they display both the broad OH stretching signal due to the hydroxyl group and the relatively sharp and very intense CO double bond stretching frequency. Um, which is here around 1,700 wave numbers. But the, again here in carboxylic acids, the breadth of this signal, the fact that it is so wide and so broad, has to do with the hydrogen bonding associated with the OH bond. This is going to weaken that bond, but to different degrees, right? To different degrees depending on um, how close the hydrogen bond acceptor is to the OH bond. 
primary and secondary amines, which contain at least one NH bond, display signals that are typical for this kind of hydrogen heteroatom linkage well above 3,000 wave numbers, somewhere around 33 to 35, 3,600 wave numbers. And an interesting aspect of amines has to do with distinguishing between primary amines, with ha which have two hydrogens connected to the nitrogen and one R group, and secondary amines, which have one hydrogen connected to the nitrogen and two R groups. Primary amines display two NH stretching signals due to what we call symmetric and asymmetric stretches. More or less, the NH2 group can vibrate like this. This is called the symmetric stretch with the two NH bonds moving in concert. And asymmetrically, and in the asymmetric stretch, while one is stretching, the other is compressing. So the asymmetric stretch looks like this. And these have different frequencies associated with them, and so they show up as two close but definitely visually distinct peaks, what we might call a doublet. This is about the only time you'll hear the term doublet used in an infrared context. For similar reasons, CH3 and CH2 groups display a, num a variety of frequencies and a variety of peaks. That's why you tend to see a mess of peaks, for example, just below 3,000 wave numbers where CH2 and CH3 bonds are vibrating in a variety of different ways. But this is a nice diagnostic way to tell the difference between a primary amine, which is going to display this doublet, and a secondary amine, which is not going to display this doublet and just have one NH stretching signal. Finally, let's talk about how to analyze an infrared spectrum. And the first thing I want to say here, which is a message I'm going to repeat in all of our studies of spectroscopy, is it is very important to think flexibly and stay flexible. You're going to see in tables and in the textbook a lot of ranges for typical infrared absorption bands. But a signal that's a little bit outside of those ranges is not uncommon. And so thinking flexibly here and staying open to the idea that a signal may appear slightly outside of a given range is going to be really, really important for success. And this will continue to be true throughout your studies of spectroscopy. Thinking sort of probabilistically here, not really committing, not marrying yourself to a particular, say, functional group or a particular bond is going to be important. Now that said, there are some concrete steps we can take to sort of carve up an infrared spectrum and make sense of what we're looking at. And the first thing to do is draw a vertical line at 1500 wave numbers and look to the left first. That's the diagnostic region where most of our characteristic peaks are going to appear. You can also draw a line at 3000 wave numbers. To the left of that line, we've got sp2 and sp hybridized CH bonds. To the right of that line, we've got sp3 hybridized CH bonds. And as you dig in and start to look for particular signals, in general, keeping in mind that these are general guidelines and rules are made to be broken, double bonds are, let's say, 1600 to 1850 wave numbers, triple bonds from 21 to 2300 wave numbers, and XH bonds are anywhere between 2700 and 4000 wave numbers, depending on the nature of X, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, etc. Now, in the ensuing slides, we're going to take a brief look at what are called correlation charts or correlation tables. These show the characteristic absorption frequencies, infrared absorption frequencies or vibrational frequencies. Both terms are used interchangeably because they're essentially the same thing for particular functional groups or particular bonds. And so you can use these charts to identify particular functional groups. Highly, highly useful. And these are going to be provided on exam. So there's no reason to memorize these ranges, right? Memorizing the ranges is bad for multiple reasons. Number one, it's not enduring knowledge that you're going to use later in your career, even if you're a practicing organic chemist. And number two, rules are made to be broken. So memorizing these particular ranges isn't really going to help you, right? If you get a double bond signal that happens to be at 1580 wave numbers rather than 1600, you don't want to think of 1600 dogmatically as the absolute end of the double bond range, right? And so for exams in Chem 2311, these correlation charts will be provided for not just infrared spectroscopy, but uh, NMR spectroscopy as well. This table shows some useful peaks in the diagnostic region. I won't belabor it, but it is a good table to take a look at and make sure you understand many of the trends on display in this table. For example, how the 
XH stretching frequencies are all universally higher than stretching frequencies for heavier atoms. How CO double bonds are at a higher stretching frequency than CO single bonds, which actually appear in the fingerprint region, for example. So take some time on your own to parse through these tables and pull out the trends. You'll see that the ideas, the theoretical ideas that we looked at previously are going to apply to many of these stretching frequency ranges. Here we have some useful signals in the fingerprint region, much smaller table because there are fewer useful signals in these, this region, and there's a lot of overlap. For example, you can see CO and CN single bonds are almost perfectly overlapping, and so not a lot of useful information we can typically get out of the fingerprint region. Finally, let's dig into this example problem where we're identifying and describing how we can use infrared spectroscopy to monitor the progress of the reaction below. And this is kind of an interesting case because we've got the same functional groups in the starting material and in the product. We've got an alkene in the starting material right here and an alkene in the product. So with two alkenes, it's not as simple as looking in a particular region of the infrared spectrum right, to recognize a functional group that's present in, say, the product that's not there in the starting material. Instead, we need to think carefully about how the double bond changes in going th from the starting material to the product. One thing that jumps out to me is, in the starting material, this double bond is di-substituted and sort of asymmetrically disposed, right, it's on one side of the molecule, so oscillations of this double bond are going to change the dipole moment of this molecule, the starting, the starting molecule. These oscillations should thus be detectable by uh, infrared spectroscopy, right, since the dipole moment will change. Is that the case in the product? Well, the product is tetramethylethylene, a molecule we've already seen is quite symmetric. And if we think about what the stretch is going to do to this molecule, well, it's actually a symmetric molecule to begin with. There is no dipole moment in this molecule. And stretching is not going to change that. There's no change in dipole moment when this carbon-carbon double bond oscillates. So there will be no C, C stretch observed in the infrared spectrum. And so what we can do is actually use the disappearance of the CC double bond stretching signal to monitor the progress of this reaction. And as it turns out, the product is favored, and so over time, eventually, all of the starting material will convert to the product and will observe complete disappearance of the CC double bond stretch in the infrared spectrum of the product.